She was a daughter of a, of a, of a general in Spain. She was born a dwarf. Someone was a hunchback, a cripple, and someone who was blind. Her parents were so upset over the fact that she had all these deformities that they did their best to hide her from the, 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 the townspeople and from all the dignitaries, the, no, the nobility. So what they did, to make a long story short, they walled her up in a room next to the chapel. And she was ensconced in that room and not able to go out. And at one point, they decided to take her to a church because they heard of miraculous healings. They took her to the church. They had her blessed. She wasn't healed. Rather than take her home or even take her back to her, to her monastic cell, they chose to leave her on the church steps. And there she was, exposed with them you know, to the town and to all its people. And yet, she held no bitterness toward her parents. And everyone that took her in was actually benefited as a result. There were miracles that were around her for those that took her in and took care of her. So with that in mind, I want to pose a question to you that comes from our formation director, Alana Berg. And this is the question. So. We have the context now. How is Dominican charity the answer to bitterness in the church? So think of St. Margaret of Castello as you contemplate this question. And I'm going to ask that we, we um, keep our responses to no more than three minutes so that everyone can respond that wants to. And if we have time left over, then others we, we can come back in and and we address issues, and we'll, we'll take this discussion from now, which is 11.45, to noon. And uh, Alana is my timekeeper. She will ring the bell gently if you are beyond your three minutes. My alarms. So whenever you start, I'll start. So we have started. Comments, anyone? How is Dominican charity the answer to bitterness in the church? You might want a framework well, yeah. or frame the question in the sense that what's going on in the church right now with the, as in society, is the siloing of different points of view within the church as to what is Catholic or Christianity or how we practice it and that the diversity of those and how do we handle so yeah. and then and think about think about uh, saint margaret of castello's response to how she dealt with bitterness in her own life she could have been bitter with her parents bitter with her circumstances bitter with society but she does none of that she she walked forth like our lady in humility and took it and so um, as john said Think about where we are in the church today and, and, and the challenges that we face. So, yeah, I'm going to leave it as not, it's maybe more, let's call it Dominican humility. So you can be, feel free to break, build on this. Um, you know, I, I didn't come to the, to the restaurant last night. But I came to Mass this morning. And I, I know, know that Father Kelber will always blow my socks off somehow. Or other. And, and the thing that I heard today that really, really struck a chord with me was when he, when he talked about um, Mary Magdalene um, realizing that the shepherd who had saved her was himself lost. <coughs> And so that, why did that respond, uh, respond resolve, res, whatever that word is, resonate that, there you go. Um, because I've been concerned, you know, in the, in the lead up to the 
you know, the citadelity of citadelities. Um, and, you know, what, you know, is, will the truth be sacrificed? You know, there's not so much any one individual teaching as the notion that, well, teachings can change. You know, that, that by itself to me is, you know, that's deadly. Um, I have never really had a strong devotion to St. Mary Magdalene until today. And so I can, you know, I can thank, thank this sermon for it. Because, um, you know, I've never really uh, uh, identified with her as a sinner. Not because I'm not a sinner. Of course I'm a sinner. Um, but um, the gospel doesn't really just talk about her as a sinner. The New gospel talks about her afterwards as an as the apostle of the apostles. But this notion of um, uh, being worried about the you know the loss of the of the pastor um, and what does she do? She's not she's not here. She goes to take care of them. Just tell me where the body is. I'll take care of them. Such a beautiful thing. So that's, that's, that's why I would take with me, and, and, and as opposed to bitterness, I'm gonna, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen with the synodality of synodalities, um, but I, and I'm, I'm worried about you know, the sacrifice of the truth, but I want to apply, uh, apply the attitude. Of, I'm sorry, it's Mary Magdalene rather than Margaret, uh, Margaret Christabella, but so it's it's, it's, and that is a good example. Yeah. I am going to, you know, I'm going to go look for my Lord. So what lessons can we take from that? We certainly started to touch on it. What lessons can we take from uh, St. Margaret of Cassell and Mary Magdalene, and how can we apply those in our, our life today, especially as we're confronted by things within the church and outside of the church that are, in many ways, uncomfortable to us all? So how, how do we respond? Um, Jesus and he looked upon the crowds 
Um, and even recently, I was reflecting on the crowd walking through downtown Spokane and the homeless, and like everybody, the crowd, I guess for a period of time, I thought was this like happy crowd that was following Jesus, doing everything he asked them to at every moment, like the very obedient, almost on robo, <laughs> robot pilot um, crowd, and it wasn't. I'm sure that there was a lot of anger and contention and disagreement. And, people who left at different points in time, and Jesus looked upon the crowds with compassion, and that was the starting spot. So um, that's what we have within our own spheres um, of influence, um, however small or large they may be. And so that's what I want to add. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, uh, yes. I'm Aaron Blair, uh, just a visitor here. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so, um, the question, um, all of those thoughts um, made me think of uh, another question, and um, this was something that a father mentioned in his talk, and John also pointed out, um, that the, this heresy, the false teaching in France that Dominic, St. Dominic was responding to, had caused both societies and the church to degenerate or to fall into a suffering. So I, I, I wonder if we shouldn't phrase the question as how do we, how is this a response to bitterness in the church and society? <laughs> um, and, and consider the social issues which I think are foremost in our thoughts that um, that are something causing suffering to people in some in some way, whether the response really admits that or not. Um, that's so. I think maybe we can. It might be more easier said than done, but to try to think about these, um, think through these issues of, with these people who are suffering, and propose um, propose something out of compassion without sacrificing the truth of the faith. And I don't have any ready answers for that, but it um, seems to me that the, the question is be phrased in that way. I have a question for you, Aaron. Sure. To what extent are we responsible uh, to that person in terms of our compassion? Are we limited by that? Are we limited by their response, or are we, are, or are we to go beyond their response? Maybe they're, maybe they're, maybe you're being compassionate to them, but they're not, they're not receiving that compassion. They're, they're confronting you. So, my question to you and to really the whole group is, when you have someone that's confronting you and they're not accepting what it is you're offering, what can you do to overcome that bitterness? Just as. Um, St. Margaret of Castella did, and, and Mary Magdalene in terms of her humility, or even the Blessed Virgin, because Father talked about the Blessed Virgin at the cross. I mean, my goodness. Talking about getting stabbed. It was beyond a stab. Would you mind well, addressing that? The, the thing that comes to my mind is um, something that, um, that people in AA say. They say to clean your side of the street first. So it seems to me that uh, self-examination would be the answer to that bitterness. That that not not someone not receiving my compassion, I could take that as a slight to, to me personally. Mm -hmm. But um, that would not. I don't think that'd be the correct response. Just generate more. And maybe the one of the first, like, referencing AA, like, the fact that I have bitterness, right, the recognition of the problem within myself first, mm -hmm. and then taking care of my side of the street, right, uh, within my own heart, and then the fruit of that leading others to, you know, helping others to recognize bitterness and repenting and learning how to love and trust, right, because there's a lot of lack of trust in bitterness that the we won't be provided for, and that we have a lack. Mm -hmm. So, okay. 
Brian, thank you for your thoughtful comments. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Sandra? to the people, especially when he spoke about uh, the Eucharist and just about half or not more walked away. He didn't go chasing after them. He spoke the truth. He loved them, but he left it there. And that was his compassion to allow them to have their choice. Uh, and I think if we just like Father said, um, keep to the truth that that's the key. We can't surrender. We have to keep our truth and be strong in the truth. Well said, Sandra. Thank you so much. Yes, it is now noon, so we mean it till noon. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go five more minutes? Does anybody else have? <laughs> That's my prior. Well, I, 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 I have a question. Well, I've been we reading. Uh, Hold on, prior, I've been reading Derek Russo Girl. I know. And he's whatever. He uh, he addresses this, particularly his. Uh, uh, this book is called Knowing the Love of God. Originally, was known by another name, and it's been reprinted as of 2015. His points are well made. He goes through several chapters about particularly about discord in a monastery and the issues surrounding fraternal charity and what is a chapter but a small chasm of, of, of the same thing or what about the community in the church or the community at large is nothing more than a community uh, at large. There were a couple things he said that I found that are really, he says some things quite Quite well, one is, quote, a monastery is not yet heaven. It is only the novitiate of heaven, a school of perfection. So I'll just change that word, a monastery. My family is not yet heaven. <laughs> it is only a novitiate of heaven. Or that, that chap, Dominican chapter is not yet heaven, so on and so forth. Or the community of Boise, or the St. Mark's community, or whatever community you're from, the frustrations of that. And recall together that when dealing, and Aaron raised great comments and questions, and, <coughs> and our last comment he said was, in dealing with another soul, he said, quote, this is a soul loved by God in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. He or she is a member of the mystical body of Christ, called with me to the same beatitude, and, by golly, my, I added that. Uh, and perhaps to a level higher than mine, close quote. So what he's trying to say is, you know, a little humility goes a long way. He warns against rash judgment, because how often do we use rash judgment? And uh, where it can, not always, but it can lead, especially where super ignorance is involved, to a mortal sin. And he gives warning about that. And he says, this is charity when we restrain our rash judgment and we pray for another, for others. And he says in prayer, pray for the other one that, and he's, the relief of bitterness will be given. I mean, that's, that's his words. Mm -hmm. Can't find it right now. But I just thought that was an interesting uh, comment. And, uh, and Daryl Lagrange offered a nice little... Uh, you have a hand up. Max, thank you, John, very much. Max? Give me two oh, seconds, hi. Max. Just yeah. a second. Hold it. <laughs> then they won't be mute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Everybody's been staying too. within their freedom. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. It just occurred to me in the life of St. Margaret of Costello when she visited the man who was in prison whose, whose family had starved to death because he was in prison and he had gone mad and he was blaspheming God and nobody could deal with him. And St. Margaret Castella was able to deal with him and to convert him. And then, uh, so he had uh, extreme bitterness in his soul, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where he'd, uh, he hated God and so on. Um, 
but she was able to convert him, and it seems to me that it's because of uh, how she had undergone all her sufferings uh, were, without becoming bitter, so she had learned how to suffer without being bitter. So she could witness to him, he could see in her that she had also suffered, and uh, there was also a miracle she levitated, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Love grace, yes. Grace. But uh, uh, once her charity and um, her prayers for him um, and compassion enabled him, her to explain to him the errors he had made in his thinking about divine providence, and that is what enabled him to repent, right? You can't really repent unless you see that you've made a, uh, a mistake in mm -hmm. thought and in, in deed. Thank you so much, Matt. Are there any other questions before we uh, close this dialogue for this time? We'll be doing it again later this afternoon as well. With another question. Thank you. Father Reginald Pierre, who Lagrange wrote in this book called Knowing the Love of God, he said, and he talks about quite a bit about devotions and the sweetness and pi piety of devotion. But he said, do we accept the daily sacrifice which the common life demands? Now, so often we're encouraged to devotion, as we should, and what he calls the sweetness. Actually, piety is for you. you know, the term pi means kind of sweetness. And the, same uh, Latin word, or derivatives. And piety is that sweetness of devotion that we can experience. But it's not that the sole objective. Part of it is to uh, conform our lives to the will of God. And he talks about, he then therefore asks the question, are we accepting the daily sacrifice of what we are, our daily duties, our family, our job, and, and the like? Is our life like that of the saints? And I thought this was really beautiful area where he writes, the quality of our charity is not measured by the sweetness of the sensible devotion. He said, the infallible signs of progress in charity are the hatred of sin. Where do we see that today? Wrapping around, the grabbing on of sin. He also notes, and and the configuration of Christ by means of progress in all the virtues and in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That interests me. Now, in his day, when he's writing, most of society, I mean, the, the thrust of culture was against sin, right? Now we have a, a huge shift in that culture where we're embracing it, we're loving it, we're liking it. So I just thought this was. Um, a man who's a spiritual master, a, a Dominican friar that kind of put it succinctly. He's a very beautiful writer. So we'll let you know. One. Just to add to that, I'm reading the uh, love of St. Mark of Court. Oh, yeah. And it talked about even with all of his um, virtues and everything uh, and all of the miracles, that he, they talked about the common life is where he find the life of the saint. Like the saint is within the common life. How do you live right. the, the everyday drudgery? I just drudgery hope that he's shot a first good evening of rest. You know, the miracles I've done through you, the same. The life of the same is the common life. And I think Father talked about that a little bit, about humility and obedience. Right. Interesting, I think Eric Rouge dives into that too. After working a miracle, he goes back and cleans the trees. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it's true. Right. It's true. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, actually, before beginning, uh, you know, it's important, these two these two elements. One is uh, you look at the Dominican saints, and yes, they are always in the context, or very frequently, in the context of other influential Dominicans. So you have these collections of saints, you know, Thomas, uh, St. Albert the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas, um, Blessed John de Minici, Fra Angelico, uh, uh, St. Antonius of Florence. St. Lima in the Lima, St. Rosa of Lima, St. Martin of Flores, St. Juan Macias. So these, they influence each other. Even if they always live in community, when they influence each other like this, 
there's a striving for holiness and encouragement. And they're also then always born, usually born out of a particular kind of community uh, of, uh, of, of the world. You know, so the, fact, um, the fraternity uh, is, is essential in, in, in that formation. The monastic life and family life are both referred to as a school of charity, in, in part because of the rubbing against um, of each other. My, um, um, our teacher in the novitiate who taught us history, Father Finbar Hayes, once said that when you, before he moved from Ireland, when he was a kid, he remembers the, uh, I guess he moved in high school, and he remembers the maid putting potatoes in a bucket with water, and then taking the uh, broom handle and stirring them, and so that the, the potatoes would, would wash themselves by running against each other, and then she brought out the dirty water. You know? mm. And so, so we see that, and that, and that, so that, that home, and part of the answer to this to the question earlier is about, you know, this idea that, um, Sometimes it's with your brother who won't sing on tempo in choir, or uh, or, or, or your in your chapter who, who 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 has good insights but talks a lot, you know, you know whatever you know whatever it is that 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 form us and that that mutual charity and self giving. The other thing with the devotional, I don't know if I talk about them here. Devotions are are, are you know those few decades here. Oh, you know, you don't want to be too pious. You know all these devotionals, or even then the other side. Okay, well, like I St. Jude. We love St. Jude, we have the St. Jude Trinity Plus, so like, but it's still about Jesus, okay? Yeah, we know that. We're way past that now. We, we know that. We're Catholic. We, we know it's centered on Christ. We have devotion to Our Lady and the Saints. It's okay. In fact, in the Dominican, our devotion is key. And, and, and while we predate what's called the Voce Moderna, which really emphasizes that kind of devotion, look at the early Dominicans. What would they do after Compline and after the early hours of prayer? Um, there were periods of silent prayer, which you pray every want, but also during Compline, especially after Compline. They would go to the altars of the saints. You imagine in St. Dominic's in San Francisco, if any of you have seen it or will visit there soon. You go to the different altars, you go around and you have these devotions. Now, different of us, we don't have to have the same devotion, we have different sources of devotion. Um, this is why, for example, plenary indulgences, there's so many different kinds. You could do the stations, you could do the rosary, you could do uh, an hour of silence of so the Blessed Sacrament, you can read scripture. Uh, you have a devotion to say, what moves you? And it's sweetness, exactly. What moves you? Is it the liturgy itself? Is it, what is it? What is it that there's different ways to pray and we're all engaged in different kinds of prayer, but what really then would you encounter Christ? And it's okay to feel that. We're not looking for consolation, but at the same time, we're really actually consolations for beginners, according to the Eastern Church. But then where do you continue to find the fruits of the Spirit? And what, what energizes you? You know, is, is, it, is, it, is it Christ in the scriptures? Is it, uh, is, it, is it your favorite saint? Is it more than one thing? Devotion. St. Teresa Avila talks about this too. She says, the, the faith, God, God's hard to see. And so she says it twice in two different ways. God's hard to see. But we can serve him in our neighbor, in our sisters, in the, in the convent. God's hard to see. But when we have our rose in our hand, or, or the child Jesus, or whatever I be, or Jesus on the cross, it makes them present, makes them real. We need that where we are um, incarnate, and, 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 and we need incarnate things to, to open that door to God, right? The knees, the icons, of course, are windows to the divine. They, they, they uh, then provide that way through that devotion, that piety. Uh, it's a very important aspect of the church and, and of Dominican spirituality. So there has to be that movement. We are not cold intellectuals. Or intellectuals that, again, form first by compassion, then the mind starts to being informed and guide them the way that compassion is, 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 a, is articulated. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today is the feast day of Mary Magdalene, and, and I could read from her proffers, but, I'm gonna, but we heard those this morning for the new feast day. We had a feast day first. And, and one of the things Pope Francis recently did was elevate for the whole church, Mary Magdalene, to a feast day. So this is actually from another Lagrange. This is a com the commentary is in the Gospel by uh, Father Marie Joseph Lagrange, founder of the Ecole Biblique in, 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 in Jerusalem. And I indirectly mentioned him this morning and others. So they went and, and began to do Catholic biblical studies and archaeology there. There's wonderful photos of them taking measurements of the uh, epicule, the um, the uh, house of Nazareth, uh, Petra, all their habits. So this is, he writes this as a story. This is an ancient way of doing it. 
of the combining of scriptures. So he's talking, these are commentaries on the Gospels of all. Mary Magdalene had preceded the rest of the women. It was still nearly dark when she discovered that the stone had been taken away. In other words, rolled back so that the tomb was open. The guards had disappeared, but she was not surprised at that, for she did not know that they had been posted there. By peering within, she saw that the body had disappeared. She saw no angel, for Jesus intended to tell her himself. In her anxiety, dreading the thought of some profanation of the body of Jesus, she immediately ran back, going straight to Simon Peter, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Distressed, she did not hesitate to declare, they have taken away the Lord from the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. We do not know, she says, <clears throat> describing her conviction also to the women who had started out with her, but who only now arrived at the tomb. When Peter and John had returned home, and John himself testifies, she did not leave. She had been the last to leave the cross and the, and the sepulcher, and she was the first to come back to the tomb that she had found empty. Now she could not tear herself away from it, but stayed outside weeping. After a while, she looks again, and entering the antechamber of the tomb, she stopped and peered into the burial chamber as though she might have gathered some information from this fresh glance. It was then that she saw two angels clothed in white, seated one at the head, and the other at the foot of the rock shelf on which the body of Jesus had been laid. <coughs> they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She failed to recognize that they were angels, for would not angels have known why she was weeping? She replied, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She did not catch sight of the burial garments, and is not alarmed at seeing these, these strangers. At present, all is emptiness and nothingness for her. She stoops again, this time to leave the tomb and go elsewhere to seek Jesus. And she encounters him without recognizing him, for she is thinking only of the beloved body that she desires to anoint with precious oil, which she fears is in profane hands. Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Thinking that he is the guardian of the place, someone she does not know. Perhaps one who does know, or perhaps one who does not believe in Jesus and that he must know what happened to the body of her Lord and consequently ought to understand her distress. And she says to him, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. It is not surprising that she set out to come to the sepulchre without giving a thought to the stone that closed it, for all her thoughts and desires were fixed on Jesus and on him alone. When she hears the voice that penetrates into her heart and takes the veil from her eyes, addressing her by her familiar name in her own mother tongue, Mary, she immediately re returns the cry, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And she is at the feet of Jesus, still weeping, but now weeping for joy. Now she is at the place of her desire, where she wants to remain so that she may continue to pour out her love. This was not the place for the sinner to shed tears on the Savior's feet. Jesus now belonged to the world above. And although he had not ascended to his Father, which would take place before long, it was necessary that he forewarn his disciples. This is the meaning of the words, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father, and to your Father, to my God, and to your God. At that moment, Mary Magdalene was consecrated the office of apostle to the apostle. She obeys, like those who tear themselves from the conversation of their master, to go and announce the good tidings, and tell us the apostles, I have seen the Lord. Let us pray. O God, whose only begotten Son, entrusted Mary Magdalene before others with announcing the great joy of the resurrection, grant we pray that through her intercession and example we may proclaim the living Christ and come to see him reigning in your glory, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Now, when I had written this, this talk, uh, the, the talk itself, is, it confuses the Marys. There's a, a debate in the church, a fun debate of how many Marys are there, really? And, uh, <laughs> and, and I think Pope Francis had recently even been elevating the feast value nine days from now, oh, is it, or is it seven, when he says you know, that there's a feast of, in addition to Mary Magdalene, of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus now. And so, so he kind of chimes in there. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> right? for, that, for this purpose, it doesn't matter, because I, I just, we know, we, I want to reflect both, whether it's one Mary for you or two Marys, they, it, it, or, or more, it's just, just these Marys that can show us the way to understand our own charism in a wonderful way. Because 
for example, certainly when we talk about Mary Magdalene as apostle apostles, we can ignore this Mary or perhaps another Mary then in the her relationship with Martha and, and its ramifications for the Dominican Rite. But some of that we've already, already touched. But we see here this, this in particular, and we know these gospel stories, but when Father Lagrange puts it in this, in this particular way, he really speaks of what I touched upon this morning, the more articulate way here, of course, of her own, this desire, this seeking. And then again, that's why the Song of Songs is there in the liturgy, this seeking of the Lord. Um, this constant seeking. Yes, she's she's seeking the body of Christ, but there's this constant seeking. She's 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 wrapped up in the Lord in a wonderful and beautiful way, and she she wants to know more. She ever wants to be here. She she is she is the true contemplative heart that really wants to be a Christ. And 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 I love that the and, and he mentions here that she's the last to leave the sepulcher. I think it's in Luke, but she just watches it. The, the, he closed the stone, and she just watches it. And it's not unlike the rabbinical commentary about Moses, who we've been hearing in, in recent days in, in, the, in the Mass, where Moses is then, the, the rabbis regarded Moses as a contemplative. And he's in a difficult place, too. Remember, he's not all happy there as shepherd of Midian. Things are looking up, but he's been exiled from his people. He, he's, he, he's, he's, he ran because he was his, the murder of the Egyptian was, was discovered. But there he is, and yet he's watching the desert. If you spend time in the desert, Fire is not a surprise, actually. It gets hot, things burn. You know, it, it's how it is. You hope it doesn't spread. But but he watched and he saw this this plant, this bush is not being consumed. And that begins that really that life of contemplation of Moses that would, would, would manifest itself in the action of freeing the people of God from Pharaoh. So here, Mary Magdalene than this one of uh, a person of repentance. And it's vague about, about that, and it's, it's meant to be, uh, especially when you consider the different way of who or which. And that's good. If, if we're kind of unsure, that's okay. It's kind of like the thorn of Paul. Sometimes I get these people an idea, you know, saying, the thorn is this. That's projection. It's vague for a reason, and it's vague so that we can all relate to Paul. Well, that's important, and in a sense, in a sense, all of us can relate to Mary Magdalene. And some of us come from a place where we didn't know Christ. Some, some of us come from a place of repentance, and some of us don't. But even that third category, was like we, we follow, we've heard the faith all our life. We, just like the Blessed Virgin Mary, we haven't relied on that. And it's only about the grace of God. And it doesn't come from ourselves. And we need to be very thankful, profoundly thankful, for the mystery of Christ unfolding in our life, right? And, and that's what we see in Mary Magdalene. This is where we have to follow her in that, in that in her devotion to the body, to the person of Jesus Christ, her, 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 her Messiah, her Lord, this devotion. And this, this understanding of, of for, for some of us, there's that sense of repentance, but there's something, Paul takes it deeper, right? And so does Mary Magdalene, of, of, of compunction, of that recognition that we are, we are, Sinful, we are lost, we were destroyed, but we are saved because the Lord's profound grace to save us and to bring us eternal life. And this is again something that's come from us, and nothing broke good. We could have done everything perfectly. Look at the story of the publican and the Pharisee. Uh, who goes away justified? But the one who recognizes the power of God for forgiveness. So St. Mary Magdalene. We see that the, one of the things that we see is that so Our Lady recognizes is because of her immaculate conception. Perhaps we can relate more with Mary Magdalene, who is lost until she is found, and it, it repeats itself. And, and she's then lost the body. But really, we know, as, as, as uh, Mike brought up earlier, um, that, that Christ is lost. But well, Christ knows where he is, right? She thinks he's lost. Then, but but the reality is she's lost again. And not in a sinful way, but wondering that desperate search of wondering where Christ is. And so in this, we, we, there's a relationship here between this, uh, her desire and the contemplation. Often, you know, our texts don't really define what contemplation is. It's not until later that it's really not until devotion moderna, and if you, that's its own subject, but for example, uh, the imitation of Christ and other writings, we have them in the order too. But really, before, when you ask the Cistercian Grimmer, you know, what contemplation, they write about it a little bit, and they talk about it, but it's really an action of God. We prepare ourselves. There's a wonderful work of a Carthusian on Lexu Divina, an early one, 
Um, and it talks about those four stages, as some of you know, of, of the actual reading, Lexio. What's it saying and what's it mean? And what's it mean to me? What's it mean to the world right now? The, the meditatio, the meditation. We'll say, okay, again, either we've read it, but we're thinking about it, what's it mean? I, I, you know, so it unfolds. Then the oratio, which is some prayer, Lord help us, or especially movement of the will, which again, referring to St. Alphonsus of Glory Stations, the cross, is that always each station ends with it, and let, do it according, do, it, do what, what you will with me, which is so key. There's that movement of the will or some, some calling down of some grace. And for the Dominican way of contemplation, it's funny, and I don't mean this as a criticism, but it's funny when you see that the Jesuits have this too. When you read a Jesuit text on Lex Divina, some of them will say, there, there's, there's the reading, there's the meditation, there's the prayer, and then there's action. Contemplation is action. They're like, okay, okay, well, sometimes. And so that's their tradition, right? For us, what is it? What's, what's next? What, what do we have to do next? For us? Well, the Lord comes when he comes. Now, I, so you know, so I grew up in Seattle, right? And then we had faith that behind the clouds somewhere, we knew it's true that the sun was there. So we knew it was there. And sometimes there would be a break in the clouds, and the, and the sun would come out. Contemplation is a little bit like that. It always provides its light. And, and, and sometimes it comes out and shines us in a wonderful way. It's the Lord, in the Dominican tradition, it's the Lord that does the contemplation piece. There is a quieter place, though, too, like I say, kind of behind the clouds. If any of you, sometimes people are saying, really struggling with prayer right now, I'm not really feeling it. They say, well, try not praying for three days or seven. Oh, you feel it. It's the consolations we don't feel, but the fruit of the spirits will be gone. And so it's there. We just listen for the still quiet voice, right? He's there. He's there. And there are those moments where the sun, the sun will break. And, and then we'll, and it's, it's up to him. And he'll sustain us with his worth, whether it's behind the clouds or not. And sometimes he'll make an appearance. That in the Dominican condition is that contemplation. But that, but but we have in Mary Magdalene that constant recognition of profound thanksgiving for what we've received from God, and that desire to find Him. And we 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 um, we, we we learn a little bit from the Carmelites here. I, I was telling you one of the great things about Garigou Lagrange, which John was reading from, is his combination of. A mystic organization with the, the mysticism of the Carmelites. Uh, and in John the Cross, you'll find this idea. He says, um, you know, have you learned about God? And you've been praying, and you found him, right? And he's so funny. He says, you found God? Cast down that idol, because that's not God. You can't find God. You keep looking. That's part of the search. It's part of and that discovery, down, yeah. you know? We learn and we can speak about what we found or what we understand, but we recognize only in part. Look at Aquinas, who says in all of his writings, and we have at St. Albert's, uh, our studio it's in Oakland, we have all of the all of the works of Aquinas that fills a bookcase full of huge tomes, before computers, and, and chat GPT, he actually <laughs> wrote stuff and filled all these, these works, and he still says, we can say more about what we do not know about God than we can, right? And so we keep looking, we keep searching, and we can speak about what we know, but in this sense of devotion, there can never be, we're never going to be satisfied in this earth. The more, the more we can know about Scripture or, or the Lord, the more we understand the truth, whatever it is, there's always more to discover, there's always more to know, and He is a, a, an unending source of, of, of truth and, and of grace and, and of, of revelation to us, right? And it'll be constantly, it constantly unfolds for us in, in our life. There's always something more to know. There's always something deeper we can go. I got, I'm sure you can relate to this in, in some form in your own faith. I know, I thought, I just thought, the, I thought the same thing about Catholic. Catholic Siena, I read the Valax, I was 20. It was just nice, you know? Or the parables, oh, I get it, okay, okay. As they get older, Oh, I see. They're simple, but they're profound. There's a, there's, 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 there's a way it takes you to the heart of Christ. And only imagine as we get older, you know, there's something in your life of faith that you can relate to there. The things, they get deeper, and they become more meaningful. And you truly then begin to hear the, the voice of the shepherd. So St. Mary Magdalene, which she's called, is just so wonderful. She becomes really a disciple and a friend of Jesus. Remember the words of the Last Supper. I have not called you slaves. I have called you friends. And here she is, that, that friendship with Christ, but that true friendship, that friendship that's mysterious in Christ, because he'll take three of his apostles with him into the garden 
where he experienced extreme suffering and asked them to stay awake and pray with him. He's, this is the same three apostles that he knows that he takes on Mount Tabor. And he shares this with them. The friendship of Christ is a true friendship. It is, uh, first, sometimes people say, you can't have a true, you can't have a relationship with God, right? No. No, it's philosophically possible. But when the Lord becomes incarnate, he makes that possible in his humanity, right? And so he does with his disciples, and he does with us. And so he draws us into this, this, this life, and he's there. He's compassionate with us too, right? He is there in our suffering and our difficulties, in our joys, and he's there. He's not just there when a grace is granted. He's the source of grace within, and then dwelling in the Trinity. But in the mystery, he, though, though we are small and little, he draws us also to help him. And he draws us, sometimes we say, oh, why do I have to carry this cross? The cross comes from Christ. The cross is Christ that we carry. And that he asks, would you share this with me? That's the friendship. The real friendship says, I am in a difficult place. I'm afraid. I am suffering. Would you, would you be with me? This is the mystery. The Lord doesn't impose something heavy upon us. He says, rather, my yoke is sweet and, and, and light. He, the, the, the cross he gives, and, and some of us carry heavy crosses at times, the cross that he gives is his own. And he's drawing us not because we're, we, 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 we want to, he wants to, to torture us or to cause us to suffer um, in, our, in our mind or in our heart emotionally, but rather because he wants us to experience that. He calls certain ones of us to experience at different points the mystery of this passion. And we have that opportunity to be there in the garden and stay awake, or to be at the foot of the cross, or to be there when the body is taken down. And we see that in Mary Magdalene, in that friendship with Christ. She got it. She was there. Peter, Peter said that we will, and, 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 and the other apostle, we will go with him to die. Uh, I will not betray you. And indeed, we know what happens. And only John is there. And John deserves his own reflection. This is what I'm going to today. Uh, but but John, John at the cross deserves his own kind of reflection as well. But, but Mary Magdalene with Our Lady is there and present and, and doesn't care about and The whole time, you see, Mary Magdalene has no concern for herself. But she only is concerned about Christ. And that is um, an interesting insight, not only her courage, but how we must have, and that's why I began with Ruth at the very first start of this morning, talking a little bit about that Dominican abandonment to, to what goes on, you know, to, 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 to really, even our conceptions about what must unfold in the day, because our life belongs to the Lord, and we have our structure, of course, of, of mass and of office and grocery and all these things. And sometimes the Lord intervenes and says, I want you here at this cross. And, and we abandoned ourselves in that way to that. And Mary Magdalene is represented that she entirely abandoned herself to Christ. She goes where Christ is crucified, where Christ is blessed, where Christ is teaching, where Christ, where Christ is among his people. She's ever there. And that's that, that friendship with Christ. And his friendship with her that shares with her the joys and the, and the sufferings that he has. So she, in a different sense, not in that complete way of the mother of God, but in that other sense, is compassion of the cross too. She experiences him. This work. She herself is is not a martyr, but will go later on to to probably to France, it seems the tradition is, and, and live as a hermitess there, um, ever that that contemplative, there mystically speaking, watching the two from 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 from, from her own cave. In Luke, this Mary, perhaps not the Mary, says. As the story goes, as they continued the journey, he entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening. Now Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, "Lord, uh, do not do not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving. Tell her to help me." The Lord said in reply, "Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her." Sometimes, again, I already spoke about the false dichotomy, at least in the Dominican tradition, between active activity and contemplation, right? It, the two are the two are important, they are central. Uh, what did I say earlier? One perceives the other in importance. Because if we are all action, we, the world has a lot of that. Well, there's not a lot of people don't act on anything at all, that's true. But there's a lot of action without thought <laughs> or center of God in our world. That's not what they're seeking, right? Our action, 
our, our witness, our preaching, is from that encounter. And the two, for us, <coughs> go together. The first, then, the, 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 the second call is the first. It follows from contemplation. To speak of God means we must know speak to God first, right? And so the two go together. And so then the, the contemplation will drive, as St. Thomas Aquinas suggests, it will drive the Dominican to action, to share the fruits of that contemplation with others. And so same here too. I mean, there's a tradition in the church of understanding very much, and rightly so, this was an activity, a contemplation, more of calm and anxiety. And there's a lot of people, just like the prodigal son, we sometimes identify with one of the others. Like, there's a lot of people who said to me, Father, you know, Martha's right. I have a sister just like this. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the truth is, and, and, and St. Thomas Aquinas and others will speak of this passage and say, we are both, we must become both, right? And for the minute we are both, it's just one precedes the other. And so what Mary is doing, Mary has two virtues here. One is the, the bridegroom is with them. And so she's just there focused on his words, ever at his feet. And she's at peace. The problem with Martha is not that she's not caring for the others, that's good, in her charity, but that even then she must have that eye directed towards Christ, and then she can be calm and trust. And, and, and so she learns that trust along the way, we think, right? Be herself being a great saint. And so we see here, again, the primary and the secondary, the one that, that begins and one that follows the other, to be the Mary and to be the Martha too. But to be an effective Martha, we must also be a Mary. And in the midst of, again, busy life, then we see that in, 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 in these saints and begin to bring it alive in our life. We have the work we have to do right now. We've all been in a place where we have to cut back, and do less. But we, but we prioritize, even if we're, we have a crazy life right now, and all we've got is five minutes to be in it at the end of the day. You know, just, and hopefully as Dominican lady, we have more time to, you know, to pray. But, to prioritize these moments as that place where we sit at the feet of Christ, to bring them in part, to, 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 to give us strength, but to bring Christ precisely in the activities of our day, in where the Lord has called us to minister and to build up his church, whatever that looks like in our life. And we see that in, in these two sisters, Mary and Martha. This balance, this, heavy, this, this um, healthy tension, as I mentioned before, is really resolved in these two. And Mary does respond. Mary is the one we see is perhaps not the way we expect. She is the one that is full of action. She is the one, in fact, that will be. She's listening and with the bridegroom at this moment, but she does act. In fact, when, when Lazarus dies, Mary stays at home in, in the house at first, but our Lord calls her. And she responds again to the voice of the shepherd. She then also, not in the way that Martha does, articulates that Christ is the life and the resurrection. But then it's later that she will then, then not only be at the cross, but then go forth and to proclaim. You see, you know, there's a recognition, right? And when she encounters her Lord at the tomb, again, she hears her voice. He doesn't look exactly correct, but she recognizes him. And why? How? It's because and she really knows the true Christ, that she's been listening. And that his voice, and his message resonates inside of her. And it's because she knows Christ, because she's been contemplating him, because she's been listening to his words, that she understands this. And it's from that credibility that she can truly say, not only have I seen someone who claimed that they were Christ risen from the dead, but she recognizes him too. Because you recognize who it is talking to her because it's her friend, because it's her Lord that she's been listening to. And that, that contemplation bursts forth in this most profound way, and she goes and says that he is risen from the dead, with, without hesitation. She didn't say, I think I saw something that looked like Jesus, I saw the gardener said he was Jesus, and none of that. She doesn't care about any of that at all. In fact, she recognizes and wants to stop there and worship. And just like, um, Peter, James, and John on Mount Terabar. Uh, he does send, there's not time yet. It's not time to stay here. But it's time then to go act. Because, because the time is the, for, you know, the time for the fishermen is, is now. It has been since then, and, and it's still occurring, where we must go and, and not 
and I come from the place of rest to go catch the harvest, right? And to be fishers of men and go out. And there'll be a time when we come to harbor and we will have that. And we can cling to the feet of the Lord and we can stay with him always and, and set up those tents that Peter, James, and John are talking about. This morning I mentioned, you know, and just now that this profound uh, thanksgiving of, 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 of Mary Magdalene. And what we, what was this clear in scripture about her is that her, her, she was the one of which the demons were cast out of. And, and, uh, and again, she was in her own sort of tomb. And the Lord calls her from that, brings her life. And she, and, and then she then attached to the Lord. So her conversion then, and this encounter with Jesus is the thing that has the most profound and transformative impact on her life. And it's really from there, not only that, that she's moved, you see, that she's moved then to this devotion of Christ, but it's there, that encounter, that encounter is so important. That uh, to Pope Benedict infants in the encounter with Christ, the encounter with Christ in the liturgy, for example. The encounter with Christ is so important, really, to me, to the know Christ. And though we can be in a whole, have a holy envy of the disciples and the apostles for seeing Christ in his life, we don't have a, a spiritual enemy in any kind because we experience it in a different way. We experience it in the, in, the, uh, in the scriptures proclaimed and the word of God that we receive in our prayer and meditation, in our studies and learning the truth. We encounter Christ and there is then, not, again, it's not knowledge I'm thinking about only here. I'm speaking about that meeting of Christ that transforms our heart like hers and recognizes in a, in, in a in a, in a gift of, of, of thanksgiving, of repentance, of spiritual renewal, of perhaps forgiveness, of the graces we see. Everything comes from the Lord. Our, our active wills are so small. All of those graces, all the gifts we have. As St. Paul says, what have we that Christ has not given? Nothing is the answer to that question. Nothing. And Mary, as Mary Magdalene realizes this, we must realize this, that our, our friend, our Lord, has given us everything. And so this is that transformative nature of Christ. She is like the one leper that came back, you know, to all of those. And many of us can be this way. And we have received graces from Christ, a profound forgiveness, a profound healing. But to remember that, and sometimes I think that we make a mistake in the modern church, we say, forget that, you ever gone to confessions? Oh, you confessed all that already. Well, there's a time where, you know, sometimes people reconfess things they don't even confess. But we have to stop. It's the priest have to stop and listen. Hey, hey, why is this person confessing this again? Is there still a wound there? Is there still a matter of, uh, of shame? There's certainly forgiveness. They're not guilty for those things. So what's going on? And how can we move that from a place of, oh, I'm still bad, to a place of, I'm saved because of Christ? You know? And that's what Mary Magdalene that kind of brings forth for us. And this is central to the Dominican kind of understanding. We've been talking about him in the context of these talks and, and, and of this feast day and of the questions we have here, this way of bringing forth the truth and compassion. And that's not something that only the Dominicans talk about. But what that doesn't mean is, again, to hold back on the truth a little bit, but rather meet someone they're at and bring them and see them their need. We, the, to, to admonish the sinner and to teach the ignorant is a spiritual work of mercy, is to bring Christ, is to bring, in our own sense, to bring the spiritual food and, and, and the water of the spirit to those who thirst, right? And so one of the places that, that, that we bring forth that is that compassion and that, and that from our own hearts so that we speak of and that experience, we can relate to those who, who suffer or who doubt, that from our own place of, of lack and God's gift of abundant gifts, perhaps of mercy, that we can speak to that Christ among us. Because that's, that's, that's the point. It's not always simply intellectualism. Look at, look at the woman at the well. The woman at the well, the Lord, she begins to recognize her as a prophet. And then perhaps then she, she, she thinks he's a prophet, and she recognizes, wow, well, this person knows all about me. But it already begins, she's not just astonished by that, but it brings, a, brings starts to bring out a healing in her. So that she opens up, and by the time she's thinking about it, you get to picture her mind racing as she runs back to the village. Because that well, we know where it is, it's outside of town. She goes back to the village. By the time she gets to the village, she says, could this be the one? I think this is the Messiah. You know, because he knows everything about me. But it's not just that fact, but the fact that she's profoundly moved by this. 
And, and, and just as Mary Magdalene of the tomb, she at the well is recognized by Christ. You know, the Lord is not a cold, theistic figure only, but rather than this, this, this profoundly loving and compassionate Lord in his life and in for us. So we'll have a devotion to the Sacred Heart, right? The idea of the Sacred Heart, the, the love of Christ for us. And Mary Magdalene experiences, she's seen by the Lord. She's seen, she's recognized Mary more than once at the beginning of, and, and again at the tomb. This woman too. Our Lord, then it seems like harsh words at first. I'm sure she's pretty back. Well, yeah, what do you know? Why do you know about my, my what are you, why are you, what are you accusing me of now? Just like everybody else. But it's not. That's what he sees. He sees the deeper person and recognizes this woman. And she's actually a saint in the Eastern Church. Because she becomes a disciple, I think it's Saint Fotina. I think it's her name. So this, then Mary Magdalene, though, then becomes, then, again, this faithful disciple of Christ with this closeness relationship, this deep loyalty um, that we see in the Gospels themselves, and this unwavering commitment she has to follow Christ uh, and, and, and support. And even if it's not the same Mary, it doesn't matter, because the, the, we see that scripture, the support of the general community of the apostles and of Jesus. To, to this, this again, like we we're saying about the Dominican life we see here, is that recognition of a community of believers. Our Lord then forms this, this, the, this proto-church with his disciples and establishes a community of, that will, in a sense, become the living stones that will enshrine them, the Lamb, right? And, and Mary Magdalene is one of those that, that we see there. So her presence and her ministry, she's already participating, you see, in the spread of the word. The word. She's already preaching it, in, in the sense they all are. They support the Lord, and some of the apostles and disciples that we know are sent out to preach the word of God. But Mary Magdalene, in this living, this community, is intimately connected with this, this preaching of the holy word. And of course, this is what we see in Dominican life. I know for me, sometimes you know, people ask me, why did you become a Dominican? Uh, it was a lot of the things I mentioned. If the Lord had appeared to me and said, hey, Vincent, what do you want to do? I would always say monk, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> uh, for my reasons. Um, and that's what I explored. I started the diocese, and I said, well, that's not quite it. I, I, I was very interested in religious life. Funny, I was, uh, the person I identified, in, identity is, is important, you know, or identify, or talk about the faith. I identified most with the abbots, always, because, <laughs> Because they know oh, they live a monastic life, but then they go out and preach. So I well, they should have an, they should have an order of abbots. And uh, so I didn't, I didn't really, but I didn't think I didn't put together what I knew of the Dominicans in a concrete kind of way until I saw the Dominicans in action. And what really moved me to to join the order was something that our, our own province had published at the time, and it described the life of the Dominicans, especially in the Western Dominican province, as as a renewal of the life of the early church, the life of the apostles. That, sh that live together, share everything in common, pray together, and preach the word of God. And I said, no, that, that's what I'm looking for. And so that community is, is so essential. It's that community is that it forms the heart, forms us in charity, but we're, we're even, you know, in the context today of this, of our, our discussions, you know, is that how do we form and, and understand and hone in and bring forth an opinion, you know? Uh, in, in our tradition, in our order, through our study, in the friars, through the study, while the individuals will preach, it's formed by the community of Dominicans that have lasted for 800 um, and, and, uh, plus years, as well as in our province or our priory. We have a period of preach where we prepare for the preaching together. For example, St. Dominic's not the only place that does this. And you well, uh, often me especially, I may or may not take what we did in the Lexi Divina in preparation, but it does provide then that context, that communal context, to re the communal way to reflect on the Word of God, the common experience. And really, if you really look, you know, what we do, just like I said, every word in Scripture is important, what we do is profoundly important. I know we've all been there. Ah, I haven't said Vespers yet. Oh, I'm so tired. We're all there. <laughs> but it is, but these things are have mystical significance, right? The, the mass is, we enter into, there's this, it's not just a foretaste of eternal life. The, the heavens open. We just don't see it. The angels and saints are among us. And we, we, we enter this, we, when our body still feels it. 
but but our soul is in this eternal moment uh, where the cross opens up and the eternal and the Lamb on the throne, and we see these things with the eyes of faith. But our 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 office and our rosary too, these are mystical ramifications <coughs> that that we pray for the the church, and we know the effect of the rosary in, in Lepanto and in bringing peace in the world. We know that that. We are drawn in individuals and vespers or lots in our office, but at the same time, we're praying for those that, that need the prayers. We're praying for those that cannot or will not pray. We're praying for the whole church. And, and, and this, this brings, this, this is a way that activates the leaven in the church, that gift of the spirit, and brings the church to life. We may wonder, but that sacrifice when we're most tired, and maybe we don't, you know, everybody wants to say that, you know, we have to sing Vespers perfectly and, and, and with great joy. Sometimes we just get through. And you know what? Sometimes that one we make that sacrifice or we scrap or we tired is the best one. Because there are many others, again, who can't or will not pray. And, and we can pray. We can give them voice. And we can pray that they, the Holy Spirit touches them as well. So this, 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 um, participation in the church. We see in the life of Mary back in the early church. It's what we participate in. We should never lose sight of that. Because I think we think the little things we do are not important. And our Conlite sister, then, Therese, shows us that that's not true. And that we do great, you know, we can look, and we always think of the same sort of be like St. John for a second. He has every virtue, changes the world, right? Prote and protects the church. The remarkable saint. But there's also then like Therese or all the forgotten ones on November 1st and 7th that built up the church by living that life. Those remember the ones Syrah was forgotten one, those ones that didn't have a name. And they then, they all of us together as living stones that bring forth Christ into the world. And we must see that, and like Therese teaches us, to do it with a great love. And to do it with great love, again, isn't always like, oh boy, this is great. Sometimes it's that, that choice. And what does the kind of say? It doesn't sound that romantic at first, but it's very important to will the good of the other. And we will the good of the other when we're patient, when we seek their salvation, when we pray for them, we pray for our enemies. Again, we don't have to be warm and fuzzy about them. We pray for our enemies, whatever it is, all these different things. I go on about that, but, but the idea that, that what we do, like when Mary Magdalene, what did she really do other than this one thing? What makes her a saint? is that she's doing these things with great love for her Lord. And we can do those things too. I remember my novice master, which I can think of was uh, <laughs> two novice masters ago, more than about 25 years ago, and said, you know, really when we live a life dedicated to God, we pray in you know, his honor, we preach in his honor, we tie our shoes in his honor. So everything becomes important. Remember that part in uh, the Old Testament where it says even our pots and pans will be holy. That's what it's referring to. That the Lord is so great, it doesn't matter if we're in religious life or in the secular world, he sanctifies everything when we do that. We must bring the kingdom of God to where he calls us. Coming back to the moment to Mary Magdalene and her contemplative life, she's ever then uh, shown engaging then in this contemplative prayer, and she can teach us that. Just like our lady can teach us, I said, you know, pondering all things in her heart. And so that constant commitment of Mary Magdalene uh, and that constant devotion uh, to, to, um, to uh, uh, her, her, her Savior and, and, and how then she's ever nourished by him. Um, this is um, very important for us then to undertake in our own life. I had mentioned here, the Luke, where where Martha um, and Mary come together in uh, um, in Bethany, with, with of course the passage where why, why is my sister not doing anything? But then coming back, as I mentioned, to, to John and and, and one of the greatest uh, this, is this greatest sign before the resurrection of, of the raising of Lazarus. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to com comfort them about their brother. And Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask for God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha says, well, I know he will rise 
and the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection of life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. <clears throat> we know, and then, well, then Mary, as I said, was called out of the house, and then she then has this dialogue with Christ, too, and she says the same thing. If you'd been here, you would not have died. But Christ in the scriptures, especially in John, always shifts the question. How often, it's kind of funny, how often does Jim, this, it, uh, how often does Jesus actually answer a question? Not that often. He answers the way he wants to ask. And it's not the way the politicians ask a question either. No, he, he has his own, it's a matter of formation. So he's fully forming the apostles. And so he leads them in this journey always. And, and, and he says in a difficult way, it's hard for us to understand for us. And remember what he tells his apostles before? You're, Lazarus has died. For your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. Wow. But he knows that he will run, raise Lazarus. It's not, it's not cruelty. He knows it's going to unfold. It, it's a matter of that, that mystery of providence. He, and so he knows that it's going to unfold. He had, I, he had probably another reason for being where he is. And yet he knows also that he will die. And he knows that he will raise, raise him from the dead. And so he goes and does this. And he shows them uh, in this, and he calls them again. Here's another calling. And it's significant what we have with Lazarus. And Lazarus is clearly dead. It's been four days. And he comes forth wrapped in the, in the burial cloth. But the Lord has the, t this, the stone removed, and Lazarus called forth. Imagine then, again, the experience that there's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of, there's a lot of grief in what we see here. Um, not only does Jesus weep, but think of the grief, of course, of losing your brother. None of us experience that, of losing a loved one in that way. And there's a grief there. There's a grief that we experience, and this is expanding, but then this resurrection, this joy, really joy we can, we can experience. I remember that rough year was when, uh, in a spiritual way, was when we had Holy Week, and a month later we had a, this, we had this, we had the death, and, it, and if we really had to do it, it kind of be, you can walk with the disciples, right? We feel some of those emotions, especially you go into the garden on Thursday, or you, you know, the, or the church is empty on Saturday. Yeah, you know, we don't all experience each year, I know, but you know those times where you really itch you. And I remember the most difficult about that one year was that we had Holy Week, and a month later we had Holy Week, because in a different sense, because Pope John Paul II had suffered and died, and in what we know, he was anointed at the end. We know he rose, you know, he rose to be with Christ. So there's, this, there's all these emotions that are there and unfold. And so then the thing in the air, we, you know, this is like, oh, hey, he's back. You know, the, we must enter into the scripture in a deeper way than that. And, and what did Martha and Mary, Mary, Martha and Mary experience? They proclaimed the faith, but they didn't manifest, themselves, manifest itself before them in a way they didn't imagine. And Lazarus will live. And it seems that he, tradition, he went to France too. But he will die. He will die again, physically speaking, right? But then Martha and Mary, especially Mary, witness that this, this the, the a greater death, the, the death of the one they had so much hope in, and go through all those emotions. There's this wonderful, if you've ever seen um, the book on medieval cities by Father Gustin Thompson, he has a, one of the plays, one of the illustrations, is an Italian version of the cross. And Mary Magdalene is, is at the bottom of the cross, um, just yelling or screaming, or, or, we, or probably wailing. Wailing is a tradition of, uh, in, in many countries. In fact, some countries even today have professional, professional wailers. Those who just will, 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 will articulate sometimes what's in the heart. It seems dramatic to those of us who aren't used to it, but at the same time, it articulates that what's in the heart. And that's so important to bring forth that grief, right? One of the things, um, I remember I mentioned Father Pinmar Hayes before in relation to the potatoes. One time, one time he mentioned um, in the Second Vatican Council, and this, you know, this, this, this Lumen Gentium that said we need to bring sure Christian hope is manifest in funerals. Great, that's good, and it was an important thing to do. We did that in the text, but in, in reality, sometimes people would jump to uh, we had adopted white as a liturgical message. You know, white was allowed not for us originally. White is allowed because white is Asia's black. White is the color of mourning in Asia. But you know, we have an option to use white, especially children, you know, so that's the case. But, but, but what about adults? So you have to be careful there, right? It's not, we, we celebrate the resurrection, 
fine, we have hope, we have all this. But so we can celebrate our life. You know, you know, when we, a friar dies, as I mentioned before, we mourn his death, we celebrate, we celebrate who he was, you know, and, and we have hope for his eternal life. But what Father Finbar says, what, one of the things we can never ignore is the mourning, and we try to erase that for a few decades. We must give people room to mourn and, and, um, and accept their, and, and, and give room for grief. Some people are ready to move on, say, I don't want to do any of that. You know, I just want to celebrate their life. But a lot of people are saying, you know, like, oh, he's in a better place now. Some people are ready for that. Like, they're there, I'm still mourning. I, I still need, I need to pray, as we're called, to, to pray for them. You know what I'm saying? So they're going to have different places, and that's okay. But, but we must allow a place for that, that grief. And Mary Magdalene, in a wonderful way, shows us the answer to that in, in our, our life, too. We, Our Lady grieves in a mysterious way, in a way that we can kind of comprehend and understand. But when Mary Magdalene, we know, we've been reflecting on it in Mass and now her desire for the Lord. She, she has this profound grief. She's, she's, she's lost again. Again, not a sinful way, but just, what am I going to do? What, what could be done? She's frantic, right? So she's really mourning and grieving. And she shows the way that we can make sense of that in only seeking God. She was going to find her way, even if God had chosen a different way of salvation. Than, than rising from the dead. The Lord, she would have found the Lord, mystically speaking, and in prayer, and found that hope that she was looking for. The Lord takes her through this journey, though in a different way. In a sense, she has to lose him, so that she can find him. In fact, all the apostles who he has to disappear. It, they have to go through this. They have to see the cross. Well, Thomas is, Thomas is a lack, I don't, I, don't, he's a, I don't think we should say Thomas is simply an unbeliever. Thomas is the apostle. I might ask the same thing. Well, I'll believe you when I see I'll see, I saw him die. I know, or I heard about it from my friends because I wasn't there. But he was crucified. <laughs> and then they pierced him with a lance. And they put him in the tomb. He's dead. I, I know what he said, but I, you know how we're part How we not? I don't know. I don't believe him. We shouldn't superficially dismiss Thomas as an unbeliever. He believes because he sees. And this is how we are. This is how we are. And, and then we must see him in a way. And we must experience that loss of Christ. We must experience that place where we recognize where he's not. So that he can fill us with who he is. That he can give him the gift of himself. And this is a profound gift that Mary Magdalene shows to us. There's only for us in our Dominican spirituality. But when we seek those who then suffer and don't have Christ. Because they're there, frantic, lost, without the Christ. Where have you laid him? Or, or where have you laid the truth? Or maybe I don't care. Maybe I'm like the soldier. Uh, or maybe I'm more worried about something else. But to bring them to that place of faith, to speak to from our own heart and bring us, bring them to that place of, of, of faith, reflecting then not only, uh, did I say, reflecting on the, on the resurrection of Christ, which is in Mary's importance, because he died on the cross, and Mary Magdalene witnessed that. Our, our Lord will tell to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen yet. And that's us. And we have, a, we have the grace to believe comes from him. Faith is a gift from God. You know, remember in, um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, the day, well, the first thing, baptism, the rite of baptism starts with a question to the parents. And it says, what, do you, what is the name of your child? What do you seek for God's child? And, or what do you seek for, for you know, um, what do you seek for Ethel Marie? And they say, baptism. But the previous, but I, but I, I do like the other way. It was just so practical, it's true. Okay, baptism. But the old way was you ask the child, the, 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 the parents and grandparents, and answer on their behalf. What is your name? When they would say, What do you seek? Faith. Faith. But faith comes from baptism. Yes, there's a mystery in the catechumens. Those who hear the word of God, the movement of faith. There's a mystery of it. Faith is infused in baptism, the gift from God, and this then. This, this gift that he bestows on his disciples and apostles we see alive in Mary Magdalene. It has to be cultivated, and he brings her through this place where she truly sees. We do not see, but we see in a different way. We see the eyes of faith. We see then through then the witness, the teachings of the saints, the apostles I mentioned earlier, uh, Mary Magdalene, the other saints. This, sometimes people will say, I don't know. How am I supposed to all believe this? I say, I don't know. I mean, I don't rely on my own smarts, you know, my own wit to, to discover God. I trust my friends. I trust Thomas Aquinas. 
and and Saint Agatha and Saint Padre Dio and, and the many others and my family, my great grandmother, witnesses of faith, who witnessed the martyr, martyrdoms of priests in Mexico. I I I I count on them and know that God moved them through this profound faith. And whenever I doubt, wherever I waver, I look to my friends, my spiritual friends, to Our Lady, to St. Mary Magdalene, and to our Lord to strengthen me in that faith. They, they didn't, many of them did not see and still believed. And I trust them. And that's the mystery of the faith. The Peter and, and John, they want to see too. When Mary Magdalene, she, she proclaims them that Christ has risen from the dead, and Peter and John already spring into action, and they go to see the tomb themselves. And what's wonderful, they're already moved to belief, because we know John looks in the tomb and sees the whatever he sees there. Some say it's because the burial clouds are folded in the manner that Jesus himself folded his, perhaps his bedcloth or whatever. John sees, it's so wonderful. See, John is the first not to see and believe. Because he looks in the tomb and there's nothing there. And he sees. And it says in scripture, and he believed. You know? And Mary Magdalene prompts that. And so it's there that we must discover, that discover that place where the Lord is and that we, he might be fill us with his presence. As just like, and, and it doesn't compare to our church. We, but it's easier sometimes to think back. The glory of God led the, Jew, the Hebrew people out of Egypt. That cloud, the pillar of cloud was his presence. And then it was settled in the tent and upon the ark, which was like a throne. And he was there even after the ark was stolen in the temple of Jerusalem. The presence until about the year 65 or 70 when it departed. That presence of God is there. And so much more is he present in the tabernacle or in our soul, you know. And so we, empty of the, of the world, empty of vice the best we can to continue to clean out then all those things that keep Christ away, become then this Ark of the Covenant, become this holy temple, become the tomb then of which Christ is alive, present, and, and not only risen, but drawing us to rise from the dead as well. Let us pray. May the prayers of Blessed Mary Magdalene help us, O Lord, who were moved by her prayers and brought back alive from the grave her brother Lazarus, dead for four days, through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Interesting that one prayer is drawn from the old rite, which clearly combines the two Marys. Um, if you want to know, I think they're, they're, they're two people. You have a question? Yes, I do. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your wonderful speech and